Hi, uh, I'm Art Bergeron, and welcome to Bergeron Briefs. Um, I do nothing but elder law. Bergeron Briefs is uh, my um, chance to talk about a specific question that may affect you um, specifically as a senior. One of those questions is what to do about your healthcare proxy, getting it, making sure you have one, making sure you get it right, and figuring out what else you need to do. So. I often talk about my friends uh, Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And when I'm talking about them usually, they are older. Um, uh, and, and, but in this case, I want to talk about the importance of a healthcare proxy to begin with, no matter what your age. Suppose that Frank and Mary are 50 and their kids are still fairly young, maybe in college. Um, the imp one of the things that they really want to think about regarding healthcare proxies is making sure their children have one when they go away to college. Why is that? Well, because if they're out of college and one of your kids has a, pro has a healthcare problem, um, you're not going to be able to access their medical records if they're over 18. You're not going to be able to talk to the people there, the medical people there, if they're over 18. Um, and, and you're not, unless there is a power, unless there is a healthcare proxy. Uh, the healthcare proxy will give you the ability to have those conversations if they have a doctor who has determined, right, that they're um, not going to be able to make those kinds of, that they can't make healthcare decisions themselves because they had a problem. Remember, we're going to talk a little bit about the fact that, though, uh, healthcare proxies do not necessarily cross state lines. Uh, each state has its own rules regarding um, how a healthcare proxy gets, a, gets, gets uh, executed, how it gets invoked, what the powers of the agent are. You're going to want to check those rules regarding the state in which your child is going if they're going out of state to college. And remember, <clears throat> executing a new healthcare proxy automatically revokes an old one. So whether you're Frank and Mary or the kids though, there is always this possibility that for some period of time um, you're going to need to have somebody making a medical decision for you. Um, so, what about your healthcare proxy if you're Frank and Mary and you're younger? Well, you want to make sure um, if you're incapacitated that there is somebody who can make a medical decision for you. Who should that be? Uh, if the kids are younger, you're, you're probably going to name each other, your spouse, as your healthcare proxy agent. But the question is, if your kids are younger, who's going to be the backup? Is that going to be one of your siblings? Is that sibling going to be different depending on whether it's you, the husband, or you, the wife, right? Because um, you, you want to make sure that if, because if there's an emergency, if there was a car accident, for example, there's a legitimate possibility that you were incapacitated and so is your spouse. So let me talk about a little bit about the basics of healthcare proxies. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they do not cross state lines. State rules may vary. Executing a new one always revokes an old one. So if you've done a healthcare proxy previously and then you go to the emergency room and the person in the emergency room says, oh, you know, we just want you to execute this proxy while you're here in case there's a problem and you execute that, technically that execution revoked your old healthcare proxy. So it would be better uh, if instead you made sure that uh, your doctor had your healthcare proxy and your doctor then emailed it to the hospital. Um, you can have a valid one in different states. Because healthcare proxies don't cross state lines, to the extent that you are spending a lot of time in another state, suppose you're going to Florida um, for a long time in the winter and then coming back to Massachusetts in the summer, you may want to execute a separate Florida healthcare proxy. You may even want the, the, the agents to be different if you're in Florida because you may have someone there whom you'd prefer to have as your emergency backup if, you're, if something has happened to your spouse. In Massachusetts, to do a valid healthcare proxy, you need two witnesses. No notary is required. Uh, the only rule regarding witnesses is that the witness cannot actually be also your healthcare proxy agent. Um, and by, the spouse can be uh, the wit a, spit, a witness, though, by the way. Um, in order for the healthcare proxy to become invoked, that is to have a, an effect, your attending physician at that time, when you're in the hospital or, or whatever, has to declare uh, in writing that you can't make a medical decision. At that point, the healthcare proxy uh, take, the, takes effect and the person you named can make all medical decisions for you. 
uh, that will stop as soon as the doc, your attending physician, even if it's a different attending physician, declares that you're competent to make the decision. So it's in effect when your attending physician says you can't make a decision, it stays in effect until the attending physician says that you can make a decision. But if you disagree with the decision of your proxy, if you are awake and you're hearing, listen, talk, talking to, a, having a conversation with your doctor and your proxy, and the doctor makes a recommendation and your proxy says, yes, do the operation or no, do, don't do the operation, and you disagree, um, your disagreement uh, automatically revokes the healthcare proxy unless a court orders otherwise. Uh, I want to especially mention, uh, and, and um, that applies also to admission to nursing homes. Uh, many folks are nervous about uh, executing a healthcare proxy because they're afraid that, based on conversations they've had with friends and others, that if they if if th that someone could using that healthcare proxy admit them to a nursing home even though they thought that was inappropriate, <laughs> if that occurs, if a, a a healthcare proxy has been invoked, and your proxy agent uh, says that you need to be in a nursing home, and you get to that nursing home and say I don't want to be here, you're saying that revokes the healthcare proxy, um, and unless there is a court order. Also, uh, in terms of your, you're actually revoking that process, that healthcare proxy, your competence is presumed for purposes of, revo of your ability to revoke the proxy. Once again, unless your doctor says, unless a court says otherwise. So, the question then is, as Frank and Mary have gotten older, it, at some point is it time to revisit your healthcare proxy? That is, to decide whether, whether there are different agents. For example, now Frank and Mary are older and so are all of their children, they may still want to, want to name each other, but at this point they may want to name one of their kids as the alternate agent. As a matter of fact, oftentimes clients will come in and say they want to name all their kids as the alternate agents. Well, you actually can't do that. A proxy agent, you can, the only, a proxy can only have one agent at a time. The reason for that is probably pretty obvious. If I'm the doctor and you're sick, and I've got three kids in front of me, I don't want to have them arguing about what decision I'm supposed to make in terms of your care. I only want to talk to one person. So you can only name one person at a time. Uh, the question that you want to ask yourself then is, who's the best agent? Oftentimes folks will come in and say, oh, I have a, I have a daughter, it's typically a daughter, who is a nurse or in the healthcare field. Uh, she knows the most, quote unquote, about healthcare and therefore she should be my agent. Well, that's not necessarily the case. The person you want as your agent is the person who's, who you're most comfortable is going to make the decision that you want to have made. That can be one of your kids. It may not be the, health, the person with the healthcare experience. It may not be your kids. It may be that you're afraid that your kids are so emotionally invested that they wouldn't make the healthcare decision that you would want to have made. So in that case, you may want to name somebody else. As Frank and Mary have gotten older also, they really want to be, should be thinking about, and you should be thinking about if you're older, in, in the situation where the healthcare proxy is invoked and remains invoked for quite a while, what, what, what does the proxy agent really know the way that you feel about the kinds of treatments that you may be uh, um, asked to undergo, about whether you would want those kinds of treatments, uh, and about um, to the extent that you'd want what I'll, what I'll call you know, serious or dramatic interventions or, or aggressive interventions in your life, um, depending on what the consequences are. So you, know, you, want, you may want to think about and talk to your kids about how you feel about living with pain or dealing with pain or dealing with ongoing nausea and whether if you needed a treatment that might prolong your life but that might cause those consequences you really want that treatment. You might, want to, you might want to talk to them about your mobility, your ability to get around and how that affects how people may want to think about the treatment that you might want. Your ability to communicate with, with others. Your memory, short term and long term. Do you want there to be aggressive treatments to, to continue to be, so that you can continue to be alive even if you can't remember anything, even if you don't recognize anyone? These are all legitimate questions. So, 
that, so th that, that leads to the kind of broader question about kind of dealing with decline. When you get older, you want to be talking about uh, or thinking about uh, how you may be wanting to deal with decline and the nature of that decline, which is very different depending on what the decline is, what the cause of the decline is. For example, suppose you have cancer. You know, we all know somebody who has had cancer. You may have had cancer yourself. There are a set of issues dealing with cancer, but there are, there, are, there, are, there are a number of things that are pretty constant no matter what the kind of cancer. Typically, there is minimal cognitive decline. There's physical problems with whatever part of the body your cancer is, is dealing with, but, but unless it's brain cancer, it, and even in, in the cases of brain cancer, the decline, the, the cognitive decline in most cases is fairly minimal. Um, you're typically staying at home. You're not just living your life in the hospital when, when you're with cancer. You're going back and forth for chemotherapy and things, but uh, you're not in the hospital all the time. Often there are a lot of issues dealing with pain and nausea, um, but you're probably going to be competent to talk about to, to your doctor and make the decisions regarding what kinds of treatments you want given those risks of pain and nausea. And you'll be able to decide whether those treatments are worth it. Uh, typically, the healthcare proxy is invoked for short times when you're going through all of this. Then there's stroke and heart attack, in which the results are really, really varied. So I want to I tell you a short story because I had a mini stroke uh, um, a, a while ago. Uh, I was actually at the office late at night and I was working. I was about to travel to go see my, my, uh, my uh, wife and my daughter and our lovely grandchildren. Um, and I was sitting there in my office and uh, um, started feeling funny. And I said to myself, hmm, I wonder if I'm having a stroke. But the way the words came out, literally because I was talking, was hmm. And I said to myself, well, this isn't good. And then my right arm started getting numb. And I said to myself, well, this isn't good either. And so I was faced at that point with, uh, with uh, some decisions. Do I want to call 911? It was an, I was in an office park in the middle of the night. The chances that they would, anybody was going to get there really quickly was fairly small. And I realized that there were three possibilities. Either I could die, and I was okay with dying, uh, or I could be fine, and I was, of course, okay with fine, um, or I could be permanently incapacitated. And did I want to be permanently incapacitated? And the answer was, Really, no, and that's why I didn't call 911, and for, fortunately the symptoms went away. But the bottom line is, if I were permanently incapacitated, I might have been incapacitated for a long time. And therefore, um, the, the, somebody could be making decisions for me for a long time. I might have had some cognitive decline for, during that time, or for a whole long while, or I might have had it for, for, for just a few days. The point is, in those situations, if I had had that kind of cognitive decline, would I be wanting to spend a prolonged period of my, of my life in the hospital or at home uh, with this cognitive inability? These are all questions that my, my healthcare proxy really needs to know. Um, then, of course, there's dementia. I could, if I have dementia, end up not being able to make a good healthcare decision for myself for a very long time. Does my proxy agent at that time know all of the kinds of decisions that or regarding all the kinds of decisions that might come up, how they could evaluate how I could respond. Um, finally, there is simply failure to thrive. People who are getting older get to the point of their lives where things are simply breaking down. At that point, your proxy, if you're not cognitively aware, may really, really want to know who you would like to see at those times, how you, what kind of comfort care you'd like at those times, what kind of environment do you want to live in, uh, how do you want to die. So there are a number of decisions that the proxy really needs to know about. So in addition to talking about the, to, to, to drafting the, the, the healthcare proxy, you may want to figure out how to have conversations with your proxy. There are two great websites that talk a little about this, the Conversations Project and Honoring Choices. I strongly recommend that you check them out. Uh, finally, a couple of other things, invoking the healthcare proxy. So, if a doctor says that the proxy has been invoked because you no longer can make medical decisions, that does not mean that you cannot make other decisions, that you can't sign a new power of attorney, for example, that you can't sign a will, that you can't sign a deed. 
this is a popular misconception among health professionals, but the, that you still have the ability to do all of these things as long as the person who is notarizing those documents feels that you are competent to sign what you are signing. The nursing home question, I think we talked a little bit about this already. If you, if you are getting forced into a nursing home and you protest, that, that, then that is, is assuming, that is the, 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 the nursing home folks have to assume that you're competent to make that decision. You can always leave that nursing home even if it is against medical advice. In addition to signing your healthcare proxy, you may want to make sure that other people are informed whether or not you have the competence to make medical decisions. That's the reason why you may want to do so-called HIPAA authorizations, authorizing all of your children, for example, to communicate with your medical providers even though only one of them is your proxy. Finally, the MOLST form. To the extent that you are concerned to make sure that if you are, if you are, if your heart has stopped, you, whether you're not, you don't want to get resuscitated. If you've stopped breathing, you don't want to get intubated. You, need, you can sign a MOLST form, M-O-L-S-T, Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment, to deal with those issues. That form also needs to be signed by your doctor. The goal of all of this is to make sure that you have peace of mind so that you're not worried about these things, and at least as important so that if they happen, the, you're, gonna get, you're getting the care that you really want to get. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please give me a call, 508-860-1470, uh, and we'll see you soon.